and hurt. I mean, uh, I've been to Eastern Russia where uh, much of that was filmed in the diaspora for the Jews in that area. And the little hovels, it was marvelous to watch this and look at it. And uh, their oldest daughter, Havala, breaks tradition. I don't know if you remember this. She what? Falls in love with a Russian who is not a Jew. And how does the family deal with centuries of Jewish tradition and this daughter who had the gall to fall in love and leave traditions behind? And Tevya struggles with it. All right. Why I must travel to a distant land. These are all metaphors for us to think about. Far from the home I love. Once I was happily content to be as I was, where I was. Close to the people who are close to me, here in the home I love. Who could see that a man could come who would change the shape of my dreams? Helpless now I stand with him, watching older dreams grow dim. Oh, what a melancholy choice this is, wanting home, wanting him. Closing my heart to every hope but his, leaving the home I love. And then Tevya at the very end, who has been doing good grief work all the way around. I mean, he has a couple of drinks one night and gets a little corny that he's working out his grief. He has to make up a dream to Golda. You remember the, the dream scene in the bed where he makes, he's working out his grief over his daughter who has broken centuries old tradition and is going to move away from uh, Anatevka to be with him and he knows he's going to lose her or does he lose her he says at the very end uh, I love this how can she think we wouldn't understand why she does what she does why she must travel to a distant land, read, metaphor, a different way of doing church. Far from the home she loves. I love high liturgy, have you noticed? And I screw up once in a while, and you guys have been marvelous about it. All right, uh, then he ends up with this. There where her heart has settled long ago. He's talking about his daughter, Havala. By the other way, the other two daughters follow suit. But this is the first one. There where her heart has settled long ago, she must go. She must go. Who could imagine she'd be wandering so far from the home she loves? Wait for it. Last line. Yet, there with her love, she's home. Your love is Christ. And this is love, St. John says. Not that we love Christ, but that Christ loved us first. And he is our love. Wherever we are in the journey of life and faith, with Christ, who uh, you've heard me say a thousand times, who lives in you, you are already home. Let the different changes happen. You're always home, see? Uh, Pastor Kim talked about the anxiety that happens. Yes, it's a slice of life. Did you think you'd have a life without anxiety? Yeah, it's a package deal. Get over it. So you've got the, the challenges and you've got the home in your heart. Now, the reason I sang that song is simply because you'll remember what I was talking about now, see? A lot of verbiage and it doesn't, doesn't work. All right, there's been changes here in our congregation. I just talked to someone who was a charter member of this church, and I'm going to the house to hear all about the history, which I purposefully not really heard all about in my interim time here, which is to preach the gospel to you, to preach God's love, to preach that you are already kings and queens, that you are part of the partnership with God. That was my purpose. Um, but there have been a lot of changes Lots of them. And all of that wears at us. 
And as you've heard me say before, hurt and anger are twins. If you don't deal with your hurt, you will give it to someone else. See, every one of us. And you might say, well, Gladys doesn't hardly ever do that. She does a little bit. I'm making this up now. There's no Gladys here. And, but all of us are like this. There's a little bit of low intensity anxiety and hurt because life has challenges that hurt us. If you don't deal with the hurt, if you don't face it and talk about it, gather together, as Luther says, as the communion of saints. That's what he meant by that. Talk about it. Share. Go ahead and, and vent a little bit. But don't stop there. Uh, Gary Gamer, where is he? Gary gave me this book a few weeks ago. Powerful book. I commend it to all of you this summer. Get in a group with the communion of saints here. You can do it. You've done it. And read that and talk about it and cry. Yes, cry. I was taught as a, a kid in the bonehead years of males, you don't cry. Well, that was just dumb. Uh, and I, as a parish pastor, and Kim knows this too, it's all, you go to these funerals and half the people are holding in their tears. They want to cry. But they're afraid that if they do in front of the one who lost her husband, that they'll simply fall apart. I've never seen an arm or a leg fall off anybody because they were crying. Crying is good. But you don't stay there. The book that, that uh, Gary gave me is Church in a Liminal Age. Church in an in-between age, an in-between time. You're going to be in between pastors. You're in between different shapes of the uh, sanctuary and the whole building and all this stuff. And here's the answer, written by two authors. They're marvelous. Number one, remember. Remember the past. You don't have to force yourself to say, I, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about the past. You should, and you should grieve it, and you should cry, yes. When the church was fat and sassy, that's what people always say. The, ch you know, it, the kids aren't here anymore, and my own children don't even go to church. And then you think you have to bolster it up by being really strong. Cry about it. It's a good release. And we need to cry, but you don't stay there just remembering. If I got this right, check me on this, Gary. The second one is letting go. Tevya. Yet there with her love, she's home. He had to let go of her, see? Not completely. He always will love her. Let go. Remember the past. Talk about the good times. Yes, laugh about it. Toast it. Cry about it. And then say, what's number two? Let it go. Let it go. Like you had to let your kids take flight if you had kids. Like you had to let a relationship die that wasn't working well, at least for the time. Let go. Take a Sabbath. Uh, how did you say that? Let it go. Yeah, it was the final Give three. It Give it a rest. See, he keeps me in line. And then thirdly, and this is the great movement of Christianity, the body of Christ, it's said all the time in the New Testament, Christian faith is death and resurrection. So the next thing you do, after you've cried, you've remembered, you've laughed, you let it go, you get a new life because God is in the redeeming business. He redeems us. She redeems us. Taking what is lost, what is old, what had to be sloughed off, and making it new, not throwing it out. Not to throw out the good years that you thought were the best when the church was fat and sassy, but it gets renewed in a new way. It, there's all kinds of reasons. I won't go through them. Read the book. Sociological reasons why the church is... Why it's become more, uh, more and more a, a community that doesn't go to church. We don't have to condemn people. We just have to take it in, cry about it, wonder about it. There's two W words that I think you should think about. Worry or wonder. Which one's best? Wonder about the, the future. Wonder about the past. You might come up with some ideas like maybe the 50s weren't all that great, even though everybody went to church. Were they all there for the Christ who is the Lord of the church? Wonder about it. And then imagine resurrection and then go into Christ's resurrection. Now, I'm going to let Kim go here next because I know I talk too much. But here's, I just want to say something about what I've seen here. Take this into your heart. An openness to two new pastors with all their idiosyncrasies. Well, I have most of them, but Kim's got a few quirky jokes. 
Hey. He's got some quirky jokes now. They're very subtle. He's a thinker. So at first they seem quirky, and then on the ride home, I'm thinking, wait a minute, there was something deep behind there. <laughs> yeah, right. That's him. He's, he's outstanding. And I'm going to grieve his face-to-face -face presence with me. I'm going to call him from the cabin and bug him because that's remembering, letting go, because i got a cabin to go to and fish to catch. You guys have no walleye up here. Uh, and, and I'm going to call him, and I said, get a bourbon, we're going to talk. See? Resurrection. Did I just put bourbon and resurrection together? In a, <laughs> not quite the same thing. Uh, you've you've, uh, you've uh, abided my odd drawings, and you've given me uh, encouragement and laughter. And laughter covers a multitude of sins, by the way. Um, I've seen a spirit of joy in you. I, I, when I say that, I, I mean that from the heart. Not just a little, a lot of joy, a lot of laughter. You got it by the bucketful. You need to remember that as you think about this call process. Yes, there's anxiety. Okay. You know, most of us here are adults. We've got a beautiful child left in here. We're adults. At our age, we're supposed to be mentors to each other. And we can be. But we have to open our mouths and share this stuff. I'm sharing it with you now. Um, a deep faith, and by that I mean living into the gift of faith without worrying that you have to be perfect. I, I hear it in Bible study. I see it when I'm with the quilters. Those ladies are marvelous. And they're the little communion of saints group that talk about these things, and they laugh. They're marvelous. That's good grieving. You're going to grieve anyway. Why not do it with some fun? That's, what, that's my point. You have a willingness to step to the plate. There's always something, uh, someone assisting me who does a better job here. Um, you've noticed that. There's always someone stepping up to read, to, to, to play, to direct the choir. You've got it. Don't forget this. In your grieving, remember what God has given you. An outstanding staff. Yeah, we've said that before, but they are outstanding. Plus helpers of every kind. Everything's ready every time worship comes around. Well, Kim and I waltz into here and everything's set up. Beautiful. That's not unimportant. You are smart, savvy, and faithful as a council. Kim is, goes to the regular council meetings. I've been going to the executive meeting because we're here on different days uh, to cover the place. You sing beautifully. Really. I'm going to share that with some of my Minnesota congregations. <laughs> We have a few. You sing vibrantly. You even harmonize. Wow. That's part of grieving well, is to move beyond remembering and letting go and singing new praises of joy to a future that you do not, as Pastor Kim said this morning, control. Wow. He was spot on. Um, you will listen attentively to sermons. I see it in your eyes. You're nodding with me. Sometimes there's a tear, a lot of laughter, whatever. You're with the uh, pastor preaching. These are all marvelous things. And I wonder if you know what it's like for us as pastors to stand here and say, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ given for you, and look at your faces. Huge. I am going to cry if I keep going. And then finally, you're good to each other. You're really good to each other. I've seen that. And I've already said the sense of humor. So I'm, that's enough. I'm going to have Kim give the real nuts and bolts of this, but I just had to have one more song, you know. <laughs> so Pastor Tom does... Uh really well with his voice and singing you a song to get us started. Uh, the song that I'm going to sing to you this morning is Not In Your Life. <laughs> so, you'll hear me sing it on the way home in the car. Right? So uh, when we talked about grief and change, my part was change. Um, on the one hand, I went back to scripture with uh, I give it a rest, the, the uh, sixth or the um, third commandment about uh, um, keeping the Sabbath day holy. Um, the other one is the handout that you got. 
uh, I went to Google <laughs> and I said, what have people said about change? And I it came up with a list of 102 things about change. And I picked 15 of them plus a couple Bible verses for you to take with. So if you have anxiety about the changes that are happening here, uh, as the headline says, take two and call God in the morning, right? Um, but there are four of them that I just would like to call your attention to. The first is when the winds of change blow, number two, some build walls. And we heard about that a couple Sundays ago. Some build walls and others build windmills. I think uh, that fits with what you're saying, uh, being hopeful. The secret of change is to focus energy not on holding the old, but on building the new. Number 10, in any given moment, we have two options, step forward into growth or step back into safety. And then number 15, the only way we can live is if we grow. The only way we can grow is if we change. The only way we can change is if we learn. And the only way we can learn is if we're exposed to new things. So you have uh, had a, a time of that already. You have a time of that ahead of you. And uh, just trust that God's presence is here with you. And uh, any anxiety will be handled with God's good grace. Okay. Um, but I do have a couple of other things. Uh, we have a couple of folks who want to talk. This is from uh, Pastor Rebecca Shervin at the Synod office. I said, uh, Rebecca, could you say a few words? And she did. So here. <laughs> the bishop staff is holding you in prayer as you continue to travel through this season of change. She calls you God's beloved here at Agnes Day. We give thanks for the steady, wise, and pastoral presence that Pastor Tom and Pastor Kim have provided over these past months. That line alone cost me 50 bucks. <laughs> as we say farewell to Pastor Tom, we wish him a restful and renewing time with his family in Minnesota. You realize that he's doing a very biblical thing after the resurrection. Peter wasn't sure what to do. And he said to all the others, I'm going fishing. <laughs> he's going fishing. So We are grateful that Pastor Kim will continue to serve as your pastor throughout the summer. In July, he will be joined by a familiar face, Pastor Dan Wilson. And Dan is pleased to be here, he said. Together, they will support and serve your congregation as you continue in the call process for a new settled pastor. The synod staff will continue to walk alongside you in this process. Rebecca says, I'm in regular contact with your call committee chair, your council president, and your interim pastors. We are all eager to see what God has in store for this next chapter at Angus Day. Transition and change can be uncomfortable, yet it is a vehicle through which the spirit of God brings new vision and a renewed sense of purpose. Thank you for remaining open to the spirit's work among you for the trust you place in your leaders, and for all the ways that you are the body of Christ in the Gig Harbor community and beyond. We are grateful for your partnership in the gospel. So, um, having had her job, um, just know that the, the uh, synod staff, which usually is about four pastors that work uh, hard on behalf of the congregations, that they are doing their best. Rebecca's doing her best to uh, help out the call committee. Okay. Um, that's Tom, that's me, that's Rebecca. Uh, Kathy, do you have a word or two to say about simply where we're at in the call process? And then I'm going to ask Rebecca Crow just to address a little bit about the, the changes, room changes and things like that. So a word or two, not many more. Um, we, uh, I grateful for Pastor Shervin's letter. She's been very supportive for us. The call committee is looking at two different um, candidates right now. Um, we are a little bit um, slowed down by scheduling conflicts that they have. And so it will probably be into July before we know whether one of those candidates is the uh, the right person for us. But we are continuing to talk to them. We're continuing to meet together and we covet your prayers and your patience as we uh, keep trying to seek who the right leader for us. And kind of nothing to do with the call committee at all, but as I listened to these two and I read Pastor Kim's list, 
Um, I liked number 12. Um, it says, stop being afraid of what could go wrong and start being excited about what could go right. Uh, and I thought, <laughs> and uh, it, it somehow connected in my brain. Those of you who are like go to tech study know that my brain kind of is like a pinball sometimes. But um, this morning, uh, Diana Butler Bass's email um, talked about the fact that next month is the 50th anniversary of the Philadelphia 11, who are um, the first 11 women who were ordained by the Episcopal Church. And they had tried for years to go through all of the proper channels saying, we are called, we want to, to be clergy, and it just wasn't working. And so they finally got a small number of male pastors, and they went to Philadelphia. They couldn't do it in the big Episcopal cathedral, so some African uh, small church there, and, and those 11 women were ordained out of order or something like that that they labeled it. But part of what she said is, those people were brave enough to just step out in faith and now at 50 years we can look back and imagine all of the change and the good growth that has happened when they went through a time of very difficult change for themselves. So that just was what popped in my mind while I was listening to this, not having prepared to say anything about the call committee. <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, if we can just hold on to each other and try and focus on what might be good that comes out of, um, you know, a year or two or three of a bit of chaos, um, along with gratefulness for really great leaders while we've been going through that. I take heart. Oh, look, tears. Yay. <laughs> this is me. I take heart in trusting God for the next stuff. This is because look how nice he was to us with these two. <laughs> wow. So it's going to be okay, you guys. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, all right. So um, these room changes, which are kind of, they got started, we, we were sort of hoping it would happen over the Christmas holiday and then long delays on materials and doors and blah, blah, blah. Here we are at the end of school. And it's, we've delayed it so that it's a good time for the preschool, no um, disruption for the kids during their spring semester, quarter, whatever they are. And uh, I stuck my nose in because I used to be an architect of sorts, and so I measured everything and drew it up to see what would fit and so on and made some plans, which Cindy has a set of plans for the new arrangement. And I, uh, let's put them on the bulletin board, too, or something like They'll be somewhere that you can see if you want to see what the heck. The, the idea is for the security of the preschool, you've read this before, and all the... Um, uh, just convenience of them. To, that's, there's a room here opposite the office, which used to be, which has until moments ago been the uh, preschool for the little biddies, I think. And they're going to be back in the very far back room on the left, which was has been the couch room. And <clears throat> so the if it's been confused about us calling them front room kids, there is no wonder because we haven't had a front room. But this room up here is going to be a conference room with a big old conference table and some seating and some other things. And our kids next year during the services actually will meet in the front room. And so they'll just zip right back there and then zip back to us in the service quietly, possibly. Possibly not. <laughs> we love our kids. Uh, so um, they're the community room, which is the second room from the end, is going to have mo even more communal functions now. Uh, the circle of couches, they're tatty couches. I like being in a church myself that has semi-tatty stuff that means we haven't filled a landfill, but 
we'll just see how that goes. We're moving exactly what we have currently, except for the worst stuff right now. And uh, it'll be in a smaller oval, and then, but things can move around, so the quilters can spread out as we do and take up the whole space. And um, the, then the conference room will have, which the front room will have the big conference table, which will have um, AV, what do you call it? Media, media Wi-Fi, blah, blah. You can do Zoom with that. So, you know, the groups who might meet there might meet in the sofas. Just do what you will, I guess. But um, properties, route, properties team yesterday moved all the stuff out of that preschool room. And then next Saturday, are we asking for more worker bees? Worker bees show up and uh, we'll get things situated in our new situation and we can do it. Thank you. So a, a last word, um, pulling on some biblical history. When God's people Israel were traveling through the wilderness, unsure of what their future was gonna be, um, they sent Moses up the mountain and says, you go talk to God, find out what's going on here. Moses went up, gone for probably 40 days and 40 nights, and he came back down carrying the commandments. Uh, <laughs> and the people saw Moses bringing these tablets down, and, and uh, they said, well, what did God say? And Moses said, well, God said, take two tablets and call me every morning. <laughs> So oh, you, can, you can take two of those 15 sayings every morning and, and call on God every morning, every evening. Okay, good. So we'll hang around if there's questions, but that should kind of cover uh, what we hope to accomplish with just addressing the changes that are coming. Uh, some familiarity through the summer, and then we'll see what the call process does. Okay? Yep. Yep.